I'm going to throw you in right at the deep end. Okay. So you're the CEO of the Open Data Institute. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about your mission there? Okay, so our, our mission at the Open Data Institute is to help companies and governments to build an open and trustworthy data ecosystem. And we do that because we think it's really important for data to flow to where it's needed so people can make better decisions, but also to be protected from any harmful impacts that you might get from data being misused. And I know that you had a long career working within the UK government. Well, um, as a contractor to you. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about your learnings within the beast, your understanding <laughs> of working with data within a, an organization as large as the UK government? OK, so um, I, I mean, I had uh, two, two uh, pieces of experience working with the UK government. So one was um, working on data.gov.uk when that was first setting up. So data.gov.uk is the, is the UK's open data portal. It's where we list. Um, uh, all the open data that's available for, from Data.gov UK. And then the other one was that I worked for a long time on legislation.gov.uk, which is the UK's legislation database. Um, and I think what, what um, came out of those two sets of experiences is that it is an understanding that data is more than the kind of um, uh, like uh, tabular data that you think of when you think of, of data. And that, that, you know, from my legislation.gov.uk experience, I know that documents can be really important data as well. And understanding them is, is, really, uh, is really tricky. Um, second is the real tension between, from a public sector point of view, between what the public sector should provide by means of access to information and what should be provided externally, what should be done by third, by third parties, by, by um, uh, companies um, or, or by community groups, um, and how government really needs to play a role as being the enabler of others to provide the services that people really need. So one of the things that you can really notice is that um, there is no way for government, with the resources that it has, to service all of the demands of all of their different kinds of users. TfL is a really good example, right? There's no way that TfL could serve all of the demands of all of the different types of commuters um, that we have within, uh, and, and tourists that we have. But um, by providing data openly and with good APIs, then it means that those different kinds of services can be provided elsewhere. Um, so those would be my like, two big main points, that data is more than just structured data. It's it documents too. Um, and the, the, the role of the public sector in providing just basic access, our basic data infrastructure, I think is really important. Brilliant. So that, that helps us understand a little bit about your background. To come back to the title of, of the talk, data rights. Yeah. How would you define a data right? How do you define a data right? So, um, I mean, the, the general data protection regulations is obviously all about our data rights. It's about what, what rights we have over um, controlling what data gets collected, um, how it gets shared, how it gets used and reused. Um, for me, then, the, the really important parts out of that, uh, out of that directive are um, well, I, I was talking about this on the other stage. There are really three main, main parts of it. There, there's trying to lock down and control and stop things from happening. There's um, uh, having a kind of positive control to enable data to be used in more flexible ways. Um, and there's the rights around kind of transparency and understanding and being able to, um, to group together with other people in order to understand and, and to object to the way in which things are, uh, things are going. Um, for me, then, the, the rights that are more around that positive control and the rights that are around um, controlling how data gets used as opposed to controlling how data gets collected are the ones that are going to really be important as we go forward. I think we're reaching the stage where it's just not plausible for us to only exercise control over what gets collected um, and what gets shared and how it gets shared. But we really need to be looking at the data rights around how um, 
uh, what can and cannot be done with data about us. And to get a little bit philosophical there, yeah. do we really own the data about us? So I strongly believe that we shouldn't use the ownership language when we're talking about data. So um, one analogy that I like to, to use is that uh, you know, if you own a house, um, then you can sell that house. And once you've sold it, then it's no, no longer anything to do with you. And you have no rights over it whatsoever. You can't control how they paint it or whether they put an extension up. Um, on the other hand, when it's data, then data that is about you is always about you. You can't get rid of the rights that are within data. And that's why ownership, I think, is actually quite a dangerous concept, because it implies that you can hand over those rights, that somebody else can um, then make decisions on your behalf over data that is about you. Um, so I don't, I don't like the ownership language, firstly, because of that, that aspect, that data about you is all, always about you. I also don't like it because, actually, it, it, data about me is not only about me. Um, data about uh, you know, what I buy and what I shop for is also about my family. Um, data about my, in, my DNA data is also about um, my, my parents as well as my children and my descendants. Um, data that's actually data that's about me is about other women who are middle class, who have children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that data, it, it, it's, it's inextricably linked to us, um, but we can't sell it, and we can't, we, we can't um, hand over control over it, and we shouldn't have the right to do that because it's not only about us, it's also about other people. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I was giving a talk a few years ago about uh, privacy by design, yeah. and I was researching the history of privacy, and I found that uh, the likes of Vince Cerf, Sam Altman from YC were, were trying to claim that data, that, that privacy, and especially privacy around data, is a sort of construct of the 20th century, and that actually we are returning to our natural state, which is radical transparency. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the long history of humanity, we've lived in these open communities and villages where everyone knew everyone's business and everyone could read everyone else's letters, and that it's a sort of false construct of the 20th century to put your letter in an envelope, have it sealed, not be able to read it, mm -hmm. and have private telephone lines and, and the like. And that certainly to me, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, seemed like a bit of a sort of false, slightly, slightly manipulative analogy because there's something different about data that is sort of eternal, transferable, monetized, mm -hmm. uh, used by all sorts of figures that you have no idea are using your data in ways that, that suit them. So I thought it was quite interesting that they'd, they'd chosen to use that, that, that angle and, and yeah. also perhaps problematic. Yeah. I think that there are two kind of aspects and uh, ways that I think about it. So um, on the one side, the, the kind of um, right to privacy is a right to not feel creeped out by the way in which you think other people might be watching you all the time, right? And it's the right to be able to go to the toilet and not think anybody else is watching you. It's the right, it's the right to, to, to my sense of self and being able to keep what I want private, sphere. private mm. right? Mm. Um, so there's, there's that, and I, I, I think that we're right to have that. I think that we have rights over that, and I think that, that, that um, we should preserve those. And we should be also very, very aware of how our exercising of our rights over that data right, is also exercising rights over other people's um, data. Um, so there's that aspect, but there's the other aspect to that, that which I sometimes think of, which is, um, you know, even if all data about me, everything was monitored, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, there was this this, um, this uh, virtual me in a box somewhere, right, that had been built up through observing me over a period of time. If it was never looked at and never used, would it affect my life? Well, no. Apart from that creepiness factor, it wouldn't actually have an impact on, on me. And what we have to be actually worried about in that context, like I say, is how that data gets used. used yeah. um, what are the decisions that are being made about me off the back of that data? And are they biased? Um, what are the kinds of, uh, what are the implications of it? Should 
that should the decisions being made in an automated way or not being made in an automated way, how do we detect those things? So, so that kind of, um, there's the ickiness bit of privacy, but there's also the, actually, when, it, when rubber hits the road, it's how is this data being used to make decisions? Yeah, and, and an example from, from a previous life when I was working in genetics, lots of women in the US were doing their 23andMe, getting their genome sequenced, right, yeah. and yeah. then finding that they had the BRCA1 gene, which suggests a tendency towards breast cancer. Yes. And actually, there was a couple of instances of, of women who couldn't get life insurance right. because they'd done their 23andMe. And of course, yes. when they took the test, they had no idea that it was going to have this effect on them. And so for me, it almost becomes a digital voodoo doll, like mm -hmm. a data double that you've created by pouring yourself into the systems you're using. Yeah. And then something can happen to that doll yeah. that sort of affects the real you and yeah. your real life. And, and which is why like, consideration of data ethics and actually when you're building those systems that are making decisions off the back of data, you need to have the, the, the built-in processes to examine what is the data that's being used. Are the people that are being... That, uh, would they have expected this data to be being used in this way? What kind of uh, impacts is it going to be having on their lives? Where is the built-in bias, etc.? Yeah. How are we communicating with people so they understand? Yeah, and, and to put another question to you, so as an investor, I see lots of pitches for companies suggesting that perhaps a way forward is if you own your data and if you control your data, then you should be able to sell your data. Mm -hmm. So why not bring this sort of market mechanism back to the individual? Mm -hmm. And just like you wouldn't want someone sleeping on your couch and not paying you rent, mm -hmm. you don't want someone using your data and not paying you for that. Yeah. How do you think, because I certainly think there are some interesting and challenging downstream consequences of, of getting people to sort of monetize their most intimate yeah. information. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I really agree. And it comes back to this, uh, this issue around ownership. Um, but I also think when you're bringing in that kind of financial um, aspect, then, then you, you start setting off some other kinds of... Um, uh, motivations in the people that are, are sharing data. Um, I, w I would love people to be sharing data, like with 23andMe, for research studies, for the benefit of humanity, right, for public good. Um, but when you introduce money into the equation, then basically you set up this thing where, where um, privacy becomes a luxury. If you can afford it, then you can keep data about you tight. If you need to get a few quick extra bucks, then you can sell information about you. And privacy no longer is a, is a fundamental human right. It becomes just a commodity that you can buy and sell. And that naturally, um, the people who are the... the uh, least able to, to deal with the consequences are going to be selling um, data. So I think that that's a, that's a real problem. I really, uh, I really don't like it. And there was something else that was coming out of your, your, your question there around, um, uh, around the, the downsides of ownership. Yes, yeah, so the, 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 I think that the, um, the reason that people go to, I need to be able to sell my data where the reason that people get to that stage is because they see the huge profits that are being made by big tech companies and they think, I want a piece of that. And that is why um, at ODI, then we don't just talk about ethics as being important, but we also talk about equity as being important. We need to have the, uh, the assurance that um, data that is being used, it, the, the benefits of that data are being shared equally. That's the only way, in, or equitably if not equally, that's the only way in which we can get around this kind of sense that it's not fair that Facebook and Google are making huge profits off the back of data about me. But the way that we tackle that is by making sure that all of us get benefits from data that is collected by those organizations and that they pay their taxes, right? So that there's this benefit back to our society from, the, um, from what they're managing to use. I, I think even to make matters more complex, you know, on the one hand, there's possibly the emergence of privacy as a luxury, but then there's also people who are underrepresented in data sets and therefore don't feel the benefit of the research that has been conducted yeah. and the systems that have been trained on a data set that don't include them. So yes, another yeah. classic example from genetics is that so much of the genetic data set that we have is Caucasian. Right, yes, And so you find yes, that as we're yes. developing personalized medicine, it actually doesn't apply and yeah. it becomes potentially toxic yeah, yeah. for sub-Saharan Africa, yeah. for example, where they have the greatest genetic variation of any continent. Yeah, and yeah. so 
in a sense, you want to be in the data set, but I suppose you want to have a little bit more control over how your data is being used. So, so the way that we um, kind of characterize this at ODI is we, we, talk, we talk in an, an, an analogy of like three different futures that we can be heading towards. There's a future where, which I call the farmland future, where we're, we're getting the best benefits out of data, where, where there's real productivity, where you see a huge range of great social and economic and environmental impacts from data being used. Um, we have the kind of future that, that is painted by the Facebook and Googles and Cambridge Analytica type you know, scenarios, which we call the oil field um, analogy. So where, where data is treated as oil, something to exploit, something that a few organizations really get the best benefit out of and the rest of us kind of left and we, we don't have this equity. And then, but the flip side to that, the reaction against the misuse of data in that oil field scenario is what we call wasteland scenario, a wasteland where, where we don't have the data that we could all benefit from, or when either as individuals or collectively or small groups decide to withdraw consent for data being used, decide that this particular type of data is not something that should be collected, or either individually or as groups we decide that. And then we really miss out on the big benefits that data can bring us, and we get the, the exact point that you're talking about there of bias within data sets because um, some groups have withdrawn that consent or some individuals have withdrawn that consent and others haven't. Yeah, and just to pick up on, as a timely example, the, the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica story, I personally was surprised by the scale of the reaction because I suppose working in this space, I kind of assumed it was <laughs> happening anyway, but yeah. how did you respond to it? How did you feel when that was breaking? Um, so I think it was one of those cases where it's, it's, it's kind of great to have the, the headlines to draw attention to um, something, as you say, that you kind of know is going on. Um, I think there, there was uh, one of the things that it really made me stop and think about was the real negative effect of what was essentially data portability, so the right to, to be able to move data from one organization to another um, with consent. It really demonstrated that that, that right, which is there in GDPR, um, can lead to actually some very poor uh, outcomes. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the essential, um, uh, the way in which uh, Cambridge Analytica got hold of data about people was through exercising essentially a data portability, people exercising their data portability right, sending data to third parties, giving permission for that, and of course not really understanding what the long-term consequences of that was. Um, so that actually made me reconsider quite a lot of the, the, um, the, the push that we have been making around data portability which I think opens up huge opportunities for innovation, for, for being able to, to create new insights, for, to, for applications that can really, really help people. But it really demonstrated some of the negative potential side effects that we might have just because of that right. Yeah. Um, the other thing that it really highlighted to me, again, was this point around the use of data. Um, because, uh, again, it actually wasn't so much that data was being captured. It, it could have been put in a vault and nobody would, would really care. It was the fact that it was used in order to target adverts and that those adverts were political adverts and that um, in, an, a, in a, a political environment, your attention on adverts is what causes you to vote in different kinds of ways and therefore it has a huge effect on our society. And quite that chain of... Um, the, of, of the, the collection of data in ways that isn't controlled, um, the sharing of data in ways that isn't controlled, and then the use of data in ways that actually I think we need to reflect on. Do we want data to be used for political adverts in those ways? Do we want to have targeted adverts in those ways? How else is data going to be used when it's collected like that? Those were the th real questions it raised. Yeah, I don't know if you've come across the work of groups like uh, IF and Sarah Gold. Yeah, yeah, where yeah. Work, we work with she's actually speaking 
tomorrow afternoon, shameless plug for tomorrow afternoon, um, and she's talking about a kind of Creative Commons license that one could create for, for use of my data. So you can say in a very clear, user-friendly interface, clearly I'm creating this data exhaust, yeah. here are the permissions yeah. that I would like to create for this data. Yeah. So, so what work are you doing with uh, Sarah? And so we, we've worked with Projects by IFA on a, on a couple of projects. One was specifically looking at data portability around the telecom sector and the kinds of things that you would have to build into um, the interfaces and the data feeds in order to really unlock um, uh, the, the potential of data portability in, the, in that sector. And then the more recent work that we've been doing is been digging into this issue of multiple people being affected by data. Um, so there are about, uh, I'll probably get this wrong, maybe 12 different scenarios that, that are really stepped through in the Projects by IF work, looking at um, different places where uh, data is actually about multiple people and the kinds of interfaces and kinds of interactions you can have in order to get permission from, from more than just the, the one person that you would usually ask permission from. And it really dug into an, it, it, um, the way in which like, uh, the individual account holder often owns a lot of power in a um, in, a, in a, uh, say, an electricity um, utility relationship when actually the data is about multiple people. And how do you redress that kind of balance? So what do you think over the next year is going to be the key battleground for the ODI? Key battle, battleground. Um, or, so, or no, that's, that's friendly, happy. Friendly, friendly, happy uh, conversation yes. area, yeah. Um, I think that the uh, I think that the repercussions of GDPR and the repercussions of, um, like I say, the data portability right and what that actually plays out like in reality, I think that's going to be a major area for, for us to be looking at. Um, I also think that the work around how we how you can build ethics into the decisions that you make about how you use data, and crucially, how to and I don't know what the answer is here how to properly um, properly engage people in the conversation, um, what kind of, what, what level of literacy is needed, or are there, are there representatives that you have to go to in order to have conversations properly about data so that we're, so that we're making informed choices. Brilliant. That sounds like a call to action for the audience and a good point for us to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you.